You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Tom grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and don't ask why. It's not a question, but a lesson learned in time. It's something unpredictable, but in the end it's right. I hope you had the time of your life. Um, you know, it's been an amazing year. <laughs> and my goodness... We are at the end of the line of Commander Legends set reviews. This is it, Josh. This is it. This has been <laughs> There's wow. like a montage sequence. I think it's like nine, ten, eleven <laughs> episodes. I think I just looked at it. It's been like six weeks of doing set reviews. Yeah. Uh, Commander Legends, hell of a set. Lots you're not to talk out. about. <laughs> yeah, I hope they don't do another one of these for a while, just for the content creation part of it, yeah. because I, I, uh, the set's obviously been awesome and a lot of cool stuff. But wow, it's been uh, a lot to talk about. Yeah, this is the final episode of our Commander Legends card analysis set reviews. We've done the partners, we've done the non-partners, we've done the pre-con decks, we've done the indie in the ninety-nine, except for this last thing. Yeah, we have blue, black, and green, and then we also have artifacts and lands. So obviously, we save the best colors for last. Just kidding, <laughs> red's not here. Um, so before we get into it, you want these cards? Yeah. No, you need these cards. Some of them, for sure. There are a lot of awesome cards. There are a lot of powerful cards. There are a lot of really cool and unique cards. I mean, this set, probably more than any set that we've ever had come out while we've been doing the show, has just tons of stuff. Obviously, yeah. you know, of course, it was made for our format. It delivers. Um, so, cardkingdom.com slash command zone, that's the place to go to order all that stuff. I think at the time you're watching this... The holidays are kind of wrapping up, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe you still have some gifts outstanding to people that you knew you weren't going to see till after the holidays, or you know, maybe you just want to get a gift for yourself. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of times, uh, one of my favorite things to get at Christmas from other people is just money because then I can buy what I want, and what I want is usually magic cards. So, cardkingdom.com slash command zone is really the best place to go because you're going to get the cards you want, but you're also going to support the content you enjoy. Not to mention, I bet you played some games maybe over the break and you realize, dang, that deck needs a tune up, or that deck needs this card that I've been thinking about. We might talk about that today on the show, or we have talked about in the past. So use that affiliate link. It's as easy as typing it in and you're helping us out. And of course, also a big thank you to Ultra Pro who sponsors our show. Not just our show, but Game Nights in particular where we're using their playmats. In front of me, I have Hans Ericsson. Josh has the Prismatic Piper. Prismatic Piper. Um, look, Seb McKinnon art. If you can get Seb McKinnon art on a playmat, Ultra Pro is the one that's going to do it for you. So that's who we trust to protect our products as well as to display our products because we're proud of the decks that we make and especially when we're going to play it against friends and families over the holidays. Yep, you want to protect all that stuff so that it doesn't get messed up. Yeah. And then f the final way to support all of our con content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You get all kinds of perks. One thing you get is to talk with Jimmy and I on our Discord. We're on there every single day. Yeah, and immediate responses too sometimes. You can yeah. have an ongoing conversation, which doesn't really happen on Twitter. Yeah, it's, I love talking to our patrons because they have really interesting things to say. They mm -hmm. get to talk to us about the episodes right after they come out. Speaking of the episodes, extra turns, game nights, patrons get to see those earlier than anybody else if you haven't watched our really hilarious and funny game nights holiday episode yeah. you should check it out but patrons got to see that before anybody else so that's another perk patreon.com slash command zone and the final perk for all patrons is that you have a chance to have your name called out on the show and this episode is dedicated to seth, seth Helenbrand. Helenbrand. seth you rock sounds like he could be a legendary creature yeah it does <laughs> it sounds like hans erickson yeah, yeah. for some reason all right, let's get into the main topic here. Commander Legends, new card analysis, part two. Part two. <laughs> Hot shots. <laughs> Love that movie. Uh, we've covered the cycle. So there are these big mythic nine mana sorceries. There is the will cycle. Um, there was the high courts that added monarch to the game, as well as white and red. So if you want to hear what we said about those cards, just go back into our channel, subscribe, make sure you don't miss any of that content. It's episode 369, and then all the other partners uh, we've covered in single episodes before that. Uh, one cool thing, Jimmy had this idea for this episode to sort of send an email out to our team and be like, hey, are there any cards we're going to talk about that, you know, you see cool interactions for or cooler synergies with? So um, Ashlyn and Craig sort of had some cards that stood out to them and they had some cool synergies and combos. Uh, 
So we're going to be quoting them throughout on certain cards. Yep. So if you want to hear how to make something, you know. Uh, more Craigy, More infecty. <laughs> Cra- all of Craig's comments are just like, good with grafted exoskeleton. Yeah. I'd... Good with triumph of the hordes. Good with, yeah. <laughs> or just like, this is how I can be degenerate with it is typically how I find Craig's comments. But yeah, we'll sprinkle those throughout the episode. All right. Okay. Let's start off with blue. <laughs> All right, the first card we have is a Salamander Pirate. Again, two words you didn't think you'd find together on the card anytime soon. It's Amphid Mutineer, three in the blue for a 3-3 creature Salamander Pirate. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target non-Salamander creature. That creature's controller creates a 4-3 blue Salamander Warrior creature token. And it has one of the new mechanics in the set, Encore. So for four blue in the blue, again, this card is four mana, the Encore cost is six mana. You can exile this card from your graveyard for each opponent, create a token copy that attacks that opponent this turn if able. They gain haste, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step, activate only as a sorcery. So the first time you cast it for four mana, it exiles something and creates a 4-3 four, four, three, for them. them. Kind of like Pongify. Rapid hybridization, similar, but it's exiling, right? Those, yeah. Those destroy. So this is kind of a big difference. The fact that exiles is huge. And then when you encore it, you're exiling three things. Yep. Now those encore creatures, of course, you're like, oh, well, you're exiling something. They're going to make a blocker for your encore thing. Well, here's the thing. You can exile all of one person's things and the encore creatures still attack other players. Right. Because, yeah, you have to attack uh, each opponent, each opponent, but you don't have to use the activated ability oh, sorry, on yeah. each For opponent. each opponent, you make one and then that creature has to attack that one. It's a little interesting wording. Uh, and also, like, that, you're not usually doing that to make four threes and hit for 12 damage. Like, you're mostly yeah. doing that because you're trying to exile three things for six mana, too. That's a really good rate. Yeah. And it is a enters the battlefield ability, which is not what you usually see on blue creatures. So yeah. this might be a rune deck inclination, the ghostly flicker dead eye navigator type effects to use it a bunch. But th- I'm more excited about that encore. And that's what Craig was really excited about as well. He called it the Eldrazi Killer, which I thought was pretty apt. Um, for six CMC, which is the same as Duplicant, you can exile three creatures. Wow. That's a good rate. Yeah. Listen, why is blue suddenly exiling creature- creatures? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I, know. I hate to start this out already, but here we are, and we keep going, like, why can't white do these things? And they keep going, like, why? No, we can't give them, you know, the really foundational things that every deck needs. But hey, blue, geez, you can just do anything you feel like. The exiling part is so huge. Like, usually yeah. blue's going to bounce it. And then even the fact that rapid hybridization and pongify exist is kind of weird, right? Like, they move that into green, and now they move that into white with generous gift. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought they were moving away from blue being able to do that because they were like, hey, white, or hey, blue, you can do enough. You don't need that anymore. But then, no, that's okay. Here comes the mutineer. Yeah. I, this is just very powerful. Like you said, comparing it to duplicant, duplicant doesn't have that encore ability. Mm-hmm. So it's less than duplicant when it comes in for four mana. And then duplicant doesn't have this other text on it that says, hey, yeah. make three duplicants later after it died and and get rid of three more things. Obviously, you make four threes for them, but we've learned that that's just not a big thing, right? You don't, yeah. you still play Beast Within. It's six mana still. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that's the thing about Duplicant is that... Six mana for just the one One, usage. the one, yeah, and the Duplicant... I mean, look, you're giving them a 4-3, but we don't care about that when you're exiling a Kozilek or a massive threat that is going to end the game. And that's the big thing, is you're exiling it, making it much harder for them to interact with. A 4-3 on the ground is just not that big of a worry. Even, like, give it Swan Song, right, is awesome. It gives a 2-2 flyer. Like, giving yeah. them a small creature in Commander is just not as big of a deal. So, yeah, I like this card quite a bit. Obviously, abusing it, blinking it and stuff is going to be good, but yeah. I think this is actually just the type of card that in, like, you know, more casual circles in the 6-7 oh, range. Oh, it's going to do like, work. This is going to be a very good card. It's going to get rid of problematic things for you, and it's also going to be on a body. Yeah, it could be white. Like you said, this would be perfectly fine in white. White I think because has it, exiled stuff quite often in the past. Right. If they didn't call it a salamander. See, the fact that I think they got caught up in the fact that it's a salamander, but <laughs> if it's, then it should just bounce things, right? Like, that right. feels, it's just the fact that it's exiling just doesn't feel right. Like, I don't, just don't understand Even why. if this Blue was doesn't need that tool. Just Pongify and is destroying it, I think that would be, be like, okay, cool, we've seen this before, but now that it, exiling does, I think, the power level jump, right, if you think about it, from yeah. going from destroying to exiling is big. Really. I basically ver- run, you know, if you're going to run a single target, get rid of something, you're going to always choose the exile if you can. Mm-hmm. So... Um, but but a cool card. I mean, it's definitely going to see some play. Yeah. All right, and let's go on to more, the... more Salamanders, the better, I guess. It is good for that, uh, what is Gore Moldrak deck, right? The Salamander tribal deck yep. or whatever? Yep. All right, the next card is Body of Knowledge. Three blue blue for an Avatar Star Star. It says Body of Knowledge, power and toughness are equal to the number of cards in your hand. It also says you have no maximum hand size. Hmm. It also says whenever Body of Knowledge is dealt damage... 
Draw that many cards. Ah, draw that many cards. So it's not like dealt one damage, only draw one. Or dealt one damage, draw one. Draw, dealt two damage, draw one. No, it's dealt two damage, draw two. Right, dealt if, 20 damage, draw 20. Yeah, if you block something that's a 10-10 with this, you're going to draw 10. Yeah, notably, uh, if it doesn't kill it with the first damage dealt, the cards you draw make it bigger. Right. Uh, so that's why this goes immediately infinite with Niv Mizzet Perun as well as the Fire Mine. Both these are cards that draw. When you draw a card, the card deals the damage to any target. So you just deal the damage to the Body of Knowledge. That draws you a card from the Body of Knowledge, which says, "Hey, trigger Niv Mizzet. I'll deal another damage to Body of Knowledge. Draw the card, and every time it's getting one more toughness because you have one more card in hand." Yeah. <laughs> After you do that, if you cast a couple cards, it will die. But by the time you've done that, you've drawn your entire deck, so you're probably fine. Yeah, I mean, this is a... Hey, you can put in that Avatar Tribal Morphon deck you made, right? True. <laughs> Wouldn't be that great. Morphon only reduces the cost by one. By one, one but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, Avatars, there's never many, so maybe I would play it. Yeah. Uh, there have been a lot of fight effects recently. Grothama decks uh, love doing this sort of thing. And I think, you know, this is the kind of card that could get really big and do a lot of damage if you fling it or have a tap ability where it can do its damage. Um, Nekusar seems like a pretty good fit for something like this. It is five mana, though, and I don't know unless you're abusing that last part which is draw that many cards whenever it's dealt damage it just seems like a good you know a generally generically okay creature right you can attack in people really don't want to block it because you'll draw cards off it and you'll probably eat the thing that you're attacking yeah i, I think it's probably not even that great in neku star because it doesn't actually make your opponents draw cards yeah and it and it's conditional card draw for you if you have psychosis crawler out i guess it could be good because that deals damage to your opponents for every card you, you draw. draw yeah so maybe it's good kind of, you know would be good there um yeah, I don't know. Seems like a really good... You wrote down Fidel Kanori, Leyline. Right. There it's is a, a great, card already... blocker. <laughs> yeah, there's a card already that... I forget what it's called, but it, it draws you cards equal to the amount of damage that was dealt to, but it's like a 4-1, yeah, and it dies flash. every time. Yeah. And it has flash. Well, if you give this flash, all of a sudden, it's going to block, draw you a bunch of cards, and maybe live, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot better. So I would consider an index that already have those two cards, which a lot of my decks do. Yeah. It's still conditional, though. Yeah, I don't know if we need more one-card infinite combos with Niv-Mizzet, but here we are. Yeah. Just Niv-Mizzet, that, Thassa's Oracle, Jace, Will Lab Mysteries, Mania. Lab Man, yeah. Just win like everybody does all the time. Enjoy it. Okay, next up is okay, one of the we most talked-about cards in the set. It is Mr. Hole Breacher. It's two in the blue for a 3-2 with Flash, a Merfolk Pirate. If an opponent would draw a card, except the first one they draw on each of their draw steps, instead, you create a treasure token. Da, 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 da. Josh, is this card not worth it to make in a format that doesn't need it? I don't think this card is necessary. Listen, we can put this on the list with Jeweled Lotus and Opposition Agent as cards. And we could have talked about this card in that video. And a lot of people asked why we didn't. Yeah, and yeah. it was just because at the time we recorded that, this wasn't previewed yet. And we didn't know when we were going to release that video and whether this was going to be previewed beforehand. So I think it's very similar to those two cards in, in the fact that I don't like it, and I don't think it's healthy for the format. The reason I don't like these kinds of cards is more towards my casual side, which is three mana means it becomes legacy playable if it's a powerful effect. And I think when you get, right, like you saw cards like... Um, true know, Name. True Name Nemesis. And obviously that card is just a really good creature, not that great in Commander, but this is a card that's good in Commander and people are talking about playing in Legacy. But not just that, it is just such a powerful effect that competitive decks, decks that want to stay more you know, interactive against decks that are going to draw a lot of cards, it's going to always be good in so many circles. I don't mind that it's good, and I don't really care whether something's playable in Legacy, other than that it affects the price of it a yeah, little that's, bit. Yeah, that's the pricing. That part, the price is the reason I don't like the Legacy bit. Yeah, but for me, like, I just don't think this type of effect is healthy for the format. And we see that, right? Because what is a good analog to this card? Oh, Leovold? What <laughs> happened to Leovold? Got banned. Why did he get banned? Because nobody, or not nobody, but not a lot high percentage of players <laughs> Very small percentage. find that fun, right? And Holbreacher does, uh, let's just lay out the combo that everybody's going to do with this card. Uh, so for those that don't know, right? It says, if an opponent would draw a card except for the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, instead you create a treasure token. So instead of their card draw, you create a treasure token. So if you wheel... Of Fortune, Windfall, any of those millions of cards that we have that do that, Wheel of Misfortune even, mm -hmm. although that's not as good because they can see it coming. If you manage to wheel or Teferi's Puzzle Box with this out, your opponents end up with no cards in their hand because they are not allowed to draw those extra cards and you make treasure tokens instead of them drawing. It's not like Smothering Tithe where you make treasure tokens, but at least they still draw the cards. Yeah. So this is like, here's the play pattern I see that's going to really suck. 
Mm -hmm. Turn three, you play nothing. On the instep before your turn, you flash this out. Turn four begins cast Wheel of Fortune. What is an opponent realistically supposed to do about that on turn three? Like, do I have to hold my Swords to Plowshares... Do I have to hold my removal spell? Do nothing on my third turn, which is the turn I need to be ramping to keep up. And even that's just in case you pl are going to play whole breach on your end step. And in a blue deck that can hold three mana open, there are a lot of options. It doesn't necessarily need to be throw whole breacher. In fact, that's one of the things that kind of makes me upset is that playing between like Aven Mind Sensor, Opposition Agent, playing into two white, two blue, or two black is just not going to be... It's going to be like a mind experiment every time. Yeah, white, I think, is is less, like, not even deserving of on that list because even Mind Sensor doesn't blow you out in the same way these other two cards do. Yeah, it's it's closer, but it, but I'd say Hole Breacher plus the fact that you can wheel is, like you said, that's the feel bad. No one likes that happening. Yeah, it's just like, hey, turn four, <laughs> this is great. Nobody has cards except for the one player. And also, they just got, like, 20 treasures treasure. to cast all their spells. It's just true, yeah. Yeah, I just... I just don't get it. Narset already exists as a planeswalker and mm -hmm. also sucks, but at least it's like sorcery speed, right? You have to play it and mo at least then you can like, it's a lot harder to wheel the same turn you play. Narset, Narset that's going to be six mana. You can also kill it with creatures, right? So yeah. a whole breacher, you have to remove it with a spell. Which you don't have any cards in your hand. So unless you had the spell ready when the wheel was mm -hmm. cast, you're screwed, right? So... Yeah, I don't like this card at all. It's very powerful. Also, I've heard CDH people say that they think this is the most powerful card in the set. Not all of them agree. I'm Yikes. just saying, like, it's at least in the discussion, right? So it's not right. just that... The fact that it's in the discussion means it's going to be up there. And, it, right, the three most powerful cards in the set, we can agree, are Jeweled Lotus, Hole Breacher, and Opposition Agent. I'll put Jessica's Will. And Jessica's there. Will, yeah, as well. Okay. That's definitely So more those CDH. are the top four, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the reason I don't like this is that let's say you're playing against a mono black deck who just played Phyrexian Arena. Let's say you're playing against a mono red deck that is using Rummaging. This does not allow them to do the thing that they're deficient at. This is an easy, accessible card. It's only got one blue pip in it, so any deck that plays blue can play it. Any you're, deck that plays blue should, right? Yeah, and you're just kind of hurting a lot of people, I think, in games where they don't need to feel the hurt. That's like one of those things about Commander that that's the rule zero, right? Like, it's like, I'm here to play this game. And it's like, wow, I came out of that game and something's happened that, like, didn't make me very happy. Whole Breacher screams that. <laughs> yeah, I came out of the game and I actually didn't get to do much, you know? Yeah. Or I, like, I don't have card advantage in my mono red deck and he played one Whole Breacher and all of my options for that, like, got halved. Like, all oh, rough. Yeah, okay, and let's talk about the other thing I don't like about this card. Because if you're going to make a card that's very good with wheel effects, don't put it in the wheel effect colors. <laughs> that red and blue. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to make a card that's just oppressive with wheel effects, put it in white. I don't understand why this card couldn't be in white. Gavin has posted on Twitter that like white only has Smothering Tithe that kind of does anything like this. But that's not true. White has Spirit of the Labyrinth, mm -hmm. which is a card that restricts the amount of cards that players are allowed to draw. And if you look through the history of Magic, usually if a color owns the do this to every player thing, it also do owns the do this to only your opponent's side of that thing, like Vandal Bass versus Shattering Spree. Right. Those of types of things. So I think White could easily have made the uh, argument that th it deserved this card or at least could have it because it does create treasure tokens mm -hmm. and it does restrict card draw. So it could easily been in white, which I, listen, I still don't want this card to exist, but let's say it's, it's too white, white. Mm -hmm. White also has flash creatures. So all this stuff is allowed. Jeez, I'd say take flash off the creature. And yeah. White, white is still like thumbs up to this, right? It, it'd be better if there was no flash. I do agree. But let's just say that like it was too white, white. So it's one more mana. Flash. It was in white. It had flash, did the exact same thing. I think then this card is at least okay. At least then it's more difficult to shove it into the wheel the wheel decks, right? Because most yeah. wheel decks do not have white in them. Yep. So, And this is, again, one of those cards, like we always say, like it's not like white has to just catch up. They have to take two steps for every one step that the other colors take. And Hull Breacher and any cards that overpower in green, it's like them taking three steps often. Well, what are the four cards we named as we thought were the most powerful cards in the set? Uh, it was a blue, black, and artifact card, and then and red, just red, well. yeah. So notably missing is white and green, and green is ahead, so them not having one is totally fine. White yeah. is behind. They don't have a card on that list. All right. We could complain about Hulk Breacher, I think, for the entirety of this episode. It's not going to do a lot of good. I just... <laughs> listen, it's undoubtedly very powerful, and it's going to suck when it happens, because you know how we know? Because we've been Leo Volded before. We've been Narsetted before. This is actually a little bit better at doing that thing than either of those. Yeah. Um, not Leovold, maybe that's not a fair comparison because that sat in the command zone, so you could start the game with it. Mm -hmm. But still, the fact that this has flash. Well, this is much easier to cast than Leovold. People would put Leovold in other decks and, and still run the same idea, you know. 
Also, when you've got Leovold as your commander, I know you've got Leovold as your commander. And you're holding up spot removal. That became a play pattern against Leovold decks. It's like, okay, make sure that you have a way to get rid of it the moment they cast it. Yep. You can't see Hole Breacher coming. So what are you supposed to do on turn three when they say, do nothing, go? On your turn, you're looking at it, and it's like, okay, well, they have three mana. Arjun's their commander. I would like to put a mana <laughs> They're definitely rock a wheel deck. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to, like, rampant growth and do something and tap out here to develop my board for later, and every player wants to do that. But if they go end step Hole Breacher, and I'm tapped out, and then they go un untap for my turn, play Wheel of Fortune. Or it, any kind of wheel effect, yeah, yeah. Windfall. The, the game is now over. So do even, I have to even do if it's nothing not, on my even, turn? Yeah, even if it's not over, no one at that table is going, so that was so cool. Maybe one player is. Yeah, yeah, the player doing it. I think like a lot of players and people watching our stuff sometimes think that we are in this like very hardcore of only value, only the best things ever. Obviously, you're going to do this, so you have to do this. That doesn't mean that we're ever like against having fun. And Hole Breacher, unfortunately, sits in this really bad place where I don't think I'm going to play this card. I don't want to play it. I don't want the expectation that comes with it. I don't want to pay the price for it. You know, for me, it's just like, I don't need this. I don't know if the play groups I'm in need this either because our games are going plenty fine before Hole Breacher came around. It's fine to say that, right? Like, I don't want to play this card and I, I don't want to play this card. But Every playgroup has Kyle Hill in their playgroup, right? They have those type of people. Kyle's going to play this card. Or dark. trending towards Kyle Hill, right? Someone that's more just like, well, of course I'm going to play it. It's great. Yeah. And you know what? I don't blame Kyle for playing it. It's a card. It's legal. He's allowed to play it. I don't like to complain about like specific cards like that. But now we're in this situation where it's like, I don't feel good playing the card because when it does what it's supposed to do, it doesn't even feel good for me. But yeah. I still have to worry about the card existing because, you know, you've got to, you know, depending on your playgroup, you've got a wide variety of people that are going to play and they're going to want to play the cards. You know, they're going to find different things cool than you find. And to accommodate that, Rule Zero only covers you so much. So, yeah. all right, enough about Hole Breacher. Okay. It, it yeah, sucks. Yeah. I don't like it. I do want to be clear. We've complained about a lot of cards here. I think overall, Commander Legends, they did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about three, three cards, cards yeah. that and are problematic. And we did make a whole video about them. But <laughs> but you could consider, consider the other 11 videos to be us making videos about the stuff we think is cool. So. Yeah. And there is a lot of cool stuff. The partners, I think, in this set, they really blew out of the water. I th the last thing I'll say. Okay. <laughs> this game is not cheap. People pay a lot of money to put cards in their decks. And I think, in general, design choices that... That's the reason people don't like stacks. That's the reason people don't like Armageddon. Is cards that take you away from being able to play the game are not as fun as ones that help encourage the game or push it forward or force something to happen that's interesting. Right? Hole Breacher is just one of those cards that, if you were, like taking baking a pie just like let's get rid of one ingredient it's like well that's gonna make the pie taste worse like yeah but it was really powerful like that pie you know i stopped your pie from tasting great it's like oh geez <laughs> i wanted that ingredient it wasn't hurting anyone necessarily <laughs> all right i will refrain from i'd rather them add a cherry on top or like some vanilla ice cream you know don't take away my sugar all right the next card is called laboratory drudge it's three in a blue for a three four zombie horror at the beginning of each end step, draw a card if you've cast a spell from a graveyard or activated an ability of a card in a graveyard this turn. So, Encore is an mm -hmm. ability of a card in a graveyard. Dredge. Dredge is an ability of a car, uh, card in a graveyard. Um, flashback. Yeah, Flashback's a really good one. That's casting a spell from a graveyard. Mm -hmm. So, this is extra card draw on something that a lot of decks are just kind of already doing. And it's each end step, which is kind of neat. Oh, uh, I didn't so even you have, that. you know, there are there are ways to activate this multiple times. There are cards like Sanitarium Skeleton or Reassembling Skeleton that are activated abilities in the graveyard that aren't like attached to a flashback keyword. Mm -hmm. um, this is obviously just like all about, you know, let's make some zombies, do some cool graveyard zombie things. Um, and you could potentially draw a lot of cards out of this. So it seems seems like a really strong utility player in those types of graveyard theme decks. Yeah, I'd say if you look at your deck and you have, you know, somewhere in the realm of like 15 different ways to either cast a spell or activate an ability out of a graveyard, or if your commander is like cast Dissident Mage or right. something like that, and your commander allows you to, to cast spells out of your graveyard, I mean, this definitely goes in cast, right? It's just extra card draw every time you do mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so like Underworld Breach is another way to do it because uh, you're casting cards from a graveyard. Embalm, Unearth, these are all similar to the dredgy slash zombies in the graveyard. Moss Will. Yeah, Moss Will, all that good stuff. Why did they print this card, Josh? This completely... Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't it white? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just came up with a new skit idea. Uh, all right. 
All right. Uh, the next one is for you to read because yes, I read the last yeah, one. There are a lot yeah. of words on that one too. So, <laughs> thanks. Sakashima's protege. It makes sense. I played Sakashima. So this that's is true. four blue blue for a creature shapeshifter. That's a three one with flash. So six mana flash. However, it's got cascade on it. When you cast this spell, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. You may cast it without paying that mana cost. And then you put the exile cards on the bottom in a random order. And when Sakashima enters the battlefield, you may have Sakashima's protege enter the battlefield as a copy of any permanent that entered the battlefield this turn. Josh, I believe we just found a mono blue ramp card. Oh, interesting. Six mana turn copy into... your land. I mean, if it's a guy's <laughs> cradle or something, that could be Yeah, sweet. yeah. Uh, well, it's probably copying like a mana rock, a good mana rock or something too, yeah. sometimes. And the cascade trigger happens before it enters the battlefield. So whatever it cascades into, you, you can also copy it with Sakashima's protege. Yeah, this card's a little hard to evaluate. I wrote down the question, like, how big of a downside is it that it only copies something that entered the battlefield this that turn, turn yeah. right? Like, it's easy to miss that part of it, but, like, if somebody has something awesome out and it comes to your turn, you can't cast Sakashima's Protege to make a copy of that thing because yeah. it didn't enter the battlefield this turn. So that's quite a large downside on a clone, and you don't always know what you're going to cascade into. That's kind of the safety valve, I mm -hmm. think. So like, now you have a card that's six blue blue flash cascade sometimes can be amazing, right? Hopefully hit a permanent. I mean, you're right. Ideally, probably everyone will have played a land in a turn, right? Yeah, that's like its absolute worst case scenario. Uh, I, yeah, you, you top deck it or yeah. it's the only thing you play. Hopefully you can at least play a land and then play it and make two lands. That sucks though for six mana. I guess six mana cascade, let's say six mana put an extra land into play cascade it's not the worst yeah especially if you're mono blue i could i mean you're not going to be like oh i'm so sad someone's going to go like wow you copied you know my land that taps for whatever two you copy the nation too it's right. cool there uh for me it's interesting because it's any per permanent right lands right. artifacts enchantments it allows blue to stretch out of its color pie again <laughs> and do something that it can't um but for me I i'm thinking about clever and person which is four mana and copies any permanent just doesn't have flash and cascade so you yeah. just have to ask yourself is the two mana worth that and i was thinking if you're playing that control deck that's holding up discontinuity yeah. sublime epiphany mystic confluence then sakajima's protege seems like something that you could potentially have in that slot of like well i'm okay holding up six mana because there's many other cards in my deck that i can use in those slots in case i can't find a good target for the protege although i'll say a lot of the stuff you're going to cascade into in that deck is not going to be as good right right so i mean depends if it's flash tribal and not counter spell tribal then maybe it's fine yeah um, yeah i think this is going to have more limited usage than it looks like when you initially look at it but when it's good it's going to be pretty sweet because you're going to be like copy something awesome cascade into something awesome yeah yeah you can play some riku and go nuts with it too to make two of them two of them yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. all right well, why not more than one How this about next two? one's pretty interesting yeah Another card that uh, a lot of hullabaloo around it, but it's eight mana, so it doesn't make it on the list with Opposition Agent and the rest. <laughs> yeah. Sphinx of the Second Sun, six blue blue, so eight mana total for a six six flying Sphinx. It says, at the beginning of your post combat main phase. Okay, main phase, combat, post, post combat, combat main phase, phase, this triggers. Or, yeah, this happens. Right. At the beginning of your post combat main phase, you get an additional beginning phase after this phase. So you get your post-combat main phase, but instead of going to your end step, mm -hmm. you get another beginning phase. And the beginning phase includes untap, upkeep, and draw. Now, notably, this goes straight after that draw step, you go to your end step. Right. It's you not back to your main phase, take another turn. So some people misinterpret it there. Right. So you can't like draw the card, untap the mana, cast sorcery speed stuff, right? Yeah. You could only really use that mana during your upkeep or end step, which is instant speed only. Yeah, if you wanted to remove this as well, you have to do it before combat's over because it's a weird thing where it triggers, triggers. at the beginning of the post-combat main phase and then the effect happens after that phase ends. Yeah. Um, and you do probably want to remove it. There's a lot of shenanigans that can happen. It's a little bit similar to Wilderness Reclamation, a little bit. It's not the exact same, right? Yeah. That's, that's not an ability that goes on the stack, it, you just go into the phase again. Yeah, so if you're going to do anything, right, you're going to untap, like, okay, I can float the man, then untap, then tap it again, but you have to do it within the untap phase. Or... But you can't. You can't do anything during the untap yeah. phase. So there's not really a good way to double your mana like Wilderness Reclamation could, where you float it, then it untaps, then you... Float it again, yeah. Float it again, yeah. Um, still, very powerful effect. A lot of cool things you can do. The first sort of, I think, most obvious thing is any commander that has an upkeep trigger or cares about the upkeep the Sphinx is going to make that happen twice, right? Mm -hmm. So Braids, oh man, Braids. Braids can put so this good. out Blue braids. and then put another thing out. 
which yeah, is kind of so, cool. So Braids puts this out during its upkeep as the free thing you get from Braids. Yeah. <laughs> and then in your post-combat main phase, you get another... You're gonna, or sorry, before your end step, you're gonna get another beginning phase, which means braids will trigger again. You'll put another thing out. Yeah, if you somehow manage to play braids and then cheat this out in the same turn, one of the problems with braids is that you don't get the upkeep trigger, and everyone else gets a round of it. So that's a way for. I think this is like a really nice fit in braids for that reason too. Yeah, um, Unesh Cryosphinx Sovereign is a Sphinx that is Sphinx Tribal. Yeah, and reduces the cost of the Sphinx, so now it's six mana. Pretty good. If you have uh, send triplets, you can do someone else's hand. However, you will have to do it at instant speed because you don't get another main phase. You have to un- untap, upkeep, choose another player. They, You look at their hand, and then you can cast stuff out of it. Yeah, but remember, on that second beginning phase, you'll only get the beginning phase, then go to your end step. Yeah. So sorcery speed stuff from their hand won't be open to you. However, it's still pretty good because all you have to do is choose a player that you think might have some instants, and yeah, you're going to have exactly. access to some of that stuff. Um, and only but a favorite, one of Josh's decks that just swamped me the first time. I was like, this cannot be magic. This is unfair. <laughs> I don't play it anymore because it blows up lands and it's pretty mean. But Joyra sure. of the Gitu, <laughs> uh, she gives things suspend and suspend counters come off on each of your upkeeps. So you would take off additional suspend mm-hmm. counters for additional upkeeps. So pretty that's cool. pr- yeah, that, that could be powerful. I could see. Yeah, I think like if you are playing a crew fix deck, then the mana that you float from the extra untap set will stay around. Um, yeah, any, anything any that cards. saves mana, right? If you yeah. have uh, OG Omnath or there's a new card mana. called Horizon Stone that kind of allow you to save your mana, then you could kind of do the Wilderness Reclamation thing where you float the mana yeah. kind of forever and then use it again later. And I guess Upkeep Tribal. Sanctum of All has an upkeep trigger for the Shrines. If you have Ancestral Vision, that's a suspend card that loses the stuff there. As Foretold cares about your upkeep. Awakening Zone gives you tokens. Growing Ranks lets you populate. Phyrexian Arena lets you draw cards. Braid of Fire gives you mana. Oh yeah, Cum- Cumulative Upkeep is interesting because it could be good with Braid of Fire, right? You yeah. get extra mana. Um, and it would move the Braid of Fire up the chain faster. faster. But it could be bad too because like Mystic Remora, it's just going to cost you more. Right. Or... Uh, glacial chasm you're just gonna lose more life <laughs> so i don't think it always goes with cumulative love keep just just braid of fire kind of or yeah. some of the other ones i think there's like uh hibernation zen or hibernation or whatever hibernation that one's zen, called yeah yeah uh and then paradox haze is the ultimate get another upkeep type card so again this is just this is gonna go in that deck i think especially if you can cheat it out or reduce the mana cost yeah if you already have paradox haze i think you think about sphinx at least it's eight mana though so it's yeah. not the exact same thing and then there's I think things could get pretty wacky if you clone <laughs> the Sphinx a bunch because it's not legendary, which is good because I don't think we want this sitting in people's command zones. But, you know, if you write a replication it or just clone it a couple of times. You get two triggers on the stack, two additional beginning phases. Yeah. Yeah. Then I think it gets starts getting a little crazy and also taking a while. So, yeah. I mean, very, undoubtedly very powerful as an eight mana spell should be. I think you probably just want to kill this every time you see it because yeah, some, nothing good's going to happen. Yeah, things are, and, and then they all, they're also left with a giant 6-6 six, six flyer too. Okay. Also, just instant speed counterspell dot deck. That's mm-hmm. a really good card, right? Because you play it and the turn you play it, it costs you no mana. So now you untap. Ah, nice. And you have all your weapons available to you. And then each other turn, you kind of get double mana because you just, you're free to cast your stuff oh, on your turn nice. and then have it all. Yeah, so, and then you don't need green like you would normally to get that effect for Wilderness Reclamation and Seaboard right. Muse, so. Okay, I like it. All right, next up we have, he does not belong in the library. It's wrong turn, two in the blue for an instant. Target opponent gains control of target creature. And if an attacking or blocking creature changes controllers, it's removed from combat. So target instant opponent- Instant speed. Target opponent gains control of target creature. Josh, I want you to have this. Something on my side of the board, something on their side of the board, whatever. You can give them that thing. Right, so you don't get control of the thing. You're casting a spell that gives someone else control of something. You could, yeah. like you said, you can even give them one of your things if you want, but you can also say, Megan, you get one of Jimmy's cards, mm-hmm. and you now control it. For Blim Comedic Genius, this works really well. Of course, it's blue, so it's not going to fit in that deck, but this is sort of like the donate stuff. So Bronze Bombshell, I thought was a really funny card, which is it's a 4-1 for 4 mana when a player other than Bronze Bombshell's owners controls it, that player sacrifices it, and then if they does, the, the thing does seven damage to the player. <laughs> So like Zedru, I think, is the other card that yeah. I think of when donating stuff. Uh, and then there's a new card called Plague Reaver that's at the beginning oh, of your yeah. end step, sacrifice each other creature you control, uh, but at any time you can discard two cards to sacrifice Plague Reaver, and then you choose an opponent, and then they get the Plague Reaver at the beginning of their next upkeep. <laughs> so it's like uh, you're like, you know, you could just sort of Hot drop potato. this at someone, yeah, and right before their end step, and if they don't, they have to discard two cards to get rid of it. So that's a that's a steep price. It's on, it's their end step that it triggers, though, so they have a second, they have their... Yeah, they have a little bit to figure out, it out, yeah. out yeah. I like that design. Um, 
Yeah, you can give commanders that only work if there is a lot of synergy around them mm -hmm. to other players. So this could like really screw over like a Gitrog deck, right? Because Gitrog's oh, not right. generally very good unless your whole deck's built around Gitrog. But when it's your whole deck's built around Gitrog, it's incredibly good and <laughs> one of the best decks out there. So just being like, hey, I'm going to give that Gitrog to you. And you can just have the Death Touch creature, but, you know, maybe you get a fetch land a little value, but you're not going to like right. combo off with it. Yeah. That kind of... Yeah. <laughs> well, like in that same vein, Golos and Joda are both big like creatures that have very important activated abilities. Oh yeah, most decks don't ha can't even make five colors, so they're just use not useless, right? They're still a creature, yeah. but they're not very good for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I call this the supreme maze of Ith, which is just like the wrong turn is this thing that can get rid of things out of combat. But right. the most important thing is that you get to, you get to take stuff. You don't get to take something for yourself, but it could be a big political tool if you know that someone's so far ahead, but <clears throat> they're banking on one creature, or that creature could do so much better in someone else's hands, or worse you know so it's a lot of interesting things this has a lot of play so i like it yeah just shutting off a lot of decks like i said get rog and jodas and stuff could be like very powerful because you just give it over there and if they don't sack it <laughs> then you know the person's got to figure out a way to kill it right 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 yeah okay moving on to green i'm gonna give you an easy one to read okay apex devastator eight <laughs> green green 10 mana for a 10 10 chimera hydra it says cascade comma, cascade, comma, cascade, comma, cascade. Yes, four cascades. Cascade four times. For the four heads on the Apex Devastator. So when you cast this, you cascade four times. You're going to get a lot of spells off of this. You're going like, to get four. <laughs> this is like Maelstrom Wanderer on crack. Uh, this is a slam dunk in Gargos Vicious Watcher, which is a Hydra that makes your Hydra spells cast four less to cast. It's a six mana <laughs> quadruple cascade. I mean, I don't want to... A lot of Hydras have X in their casting cost. True. So hitting a bunch of Hydras off your Cascade is often not great. Yeah. So, so I think you just want to maybe just do the big creatures version. I think you probably want a little top deck mani manipulation with this thing. You know, we're right. going to go into some cards that it's good with, but like you could easily be like, okay, so I hit a Rampant Growth, a Mana Rock, you know, a Dark Side. Rampant Growth lasts so that it doesn't shuffle your deck. Well, whatever. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, because you... It, it's going to cascade. Oh, it doesn't cascade, cascade all the same take, time. They're yeah, all yeah, on yeah. the stack. Whatever. It doesn't matter if you shuffle. Um, I'm saying if you don't have library manipulation, oh, then all like of a sudden that. you could, ju you know. You could just hit zero zeros. Or just like uh, two twos and three threes and like, yeah. or, or three mana stuff, you know. So, because you really want to get something that costs seven mana, six mana off this thing. You don't want to spend 10 mana and be like, I got a mana rock. I put a land into play, and yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. And my death right shaman came out. Yeah, you want to play this in Animar because you've already got giant creatures in there. So you play this, and out comes Vorinclex, uh, and it can cost green green. Yeah, exactly. Out comes Great Whale, and you go infinite somehow. You know, like there's a lot of different things there. Joda, Archmage Eternal as well, because it's got all huge stuff. Yeah, Silvala, Heart of the Wilds is going to be able to make cast mana. This. Oh my god, it's really brutal on Silvala. Yeah, um, and then again, Omneth Locus of Mana, the kinds of decks where you want to store a lot of green mana or just mana in general i put golos on the list because golos can cast this for free off of its ability and right. it also has a lot of big stuff like i think this goes in a deck where when you cascade into stuff you have a lot of large high cmc things because you really want want to pay this 10 mana the 10 10 part's not that great but if yeah. you hit you know two nine drops like let's say you hit reshape the earth and expropriate like you're gonna just <laughs> win that game right like yeah that's yeah. don't say that I don't, <laughs> you're gonna give some people some ideas out there josh <laughs> Cool. Apex Devastator. All right, next up is Dawn Glade Regent, five green green for a eight eight elk. This is like Marshall's favorite card, I'm sure, right? Because of the elks. Because it's got Elmer all over it. Yeah. Okay. When I hope Marshall watched the last episode of Game Nights. Yeah. You tell him. Yeah. Marshall, I was are you repping, watching this? I was, I was repping limited resources real hard. Yeah, of course he's watching this. He's going to directly answer us. <laughs> this is to all 11 of our set reviews. <laughs> He's definitely got the time for it. <laughs> All right, when Dongle Region enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. And as long as you're the monarch, permanents you control have hexproof. Um, notably, it's permanents you control, so echoes of heroic intervention, which gives your permanent hexproof and indestructible. I mean, it's at sorcery speed and it's seven mana, so I yeah. don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, things that do this, give your stuff hexproof. So archetype of endurance is the creature version alongside asceticism. And then Fountain Watch is Artifacts and Enchantments. Sterling Grove is Enchantments, giving it Shroud with Greater Oromancy as well. And Shalai Voice of Plenty is sort of like the deck I think this matches the best with, which is all about giving your stuff hexproof and keeping you, you know, immune from targeted spells. But it's a lot of mana. It's a yeah, you gotta cheat it out, right? You gotta, like, be able to reanimate it, um, you know, 
natural order it something like that yeah green is pretty good at keeping monarch it's got a lot of token creatures and stuff so there is a little bit of upside there and they're good at grabbing monarch too so yeah it, putting monarch in the game is generally okay for a green deck because um, if it gets stolen from you, you can grab it back i would compare this to regal behemoth which is a conspiracy card and when it enters the battlefield you become a monarch but also when you tap a land for mana if you're the monarch you add an additional mana of any color so i think that is a much more relevant commander ability well, I think they're useful in different situations. So Regal Behemoth is saying like, hey, if I untap, then my next turn is going to be crazy. Mm-hmm. Dawn Glade Regent is saying, hey, my board is currently good. And if I and if this stays out here, you're not going to be able to touch it. Yeah. So it protects your board, whereas Regal Behemoth kind of helps you build the win. I think Regal Behemoth is better, honestly, because if it if you untap and then do a bunch of crazy stuff, that's generally going to be better than something like Don Glade Regent that's saying like, I have this flimsy way I'm protecting everything. Because that proof <laughs> is good, but it's not like it doesn't there's stop no way around bugs. it. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. right. Yeah, but it is all permanent. So your enchantments, planeswalkers, whatever. Um, and it's even itself too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of nice. It protects itself. Usually these cards don't protect themselves. But I can see your opponents working together to be like, hey, let's get through that. Somehow deal damage so the monarch's gone and then we'll yeah. whatever. So... Yeah, it's, it's really easy to take Monarch as well. Like, a Flyer will just steal it away. A 1-1. One, one. All right, the next card is Magus of the Order. Speaking of natural order, it's two green green for a 3-3 <laughs> three, three human wizard. Pay a green, tap it, and sacrifice the Magus of the Order and another green creature. So you have to sacrifice the Magus, a green creature, and pay one, and tap this thing. So it can't do it, the turn comes into play. And it costs four mana, so that's a... It's a, it's a lot. It's yeah. an investment, for sure. But it, then it natural orders, which means you search your library for a green creature card, put it onto the battlefield, straight on the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. So you have to sack a specifically green creature with the Magus, and you can only go find a specifically green creature. You can't go find Eldrazi and stuff with this. But it is cheating a card. It's tutoring and cheating it into play, right? Like, it's, yeah. Yeah. The thing about natural order is that if someone, you know, tries to cast it, it's part of the sacrifice, it's part of the cost, right? So it's really hard to interact with. Mag is not so hard to interact with. It's a creature that you're going to see it coming uh, unless they're able to give it haste, in which case they need five man to do so. The thing is that it sacrifices itself and another thing. So that's two cards down. Do not get hosed by opposition agent when it comes to this. <laughs> you just just have constantly in your mind now when you're playing, if someone's playing black and has three mana open, they could have opposition agent. Yeah. Do I really want to do a tutor effect? Yeah, you just always got to think about it. Yeah, I mean, natural order, very powerful. One of the things that makes it powerful is that you often play it in a deck with a lot of um, mana dorks. Mm-hmm. So it's like turn one, birds of paradise, and then your turn three, natural order, sacking the birds of paradise, putting something nuts, so like Nyx Blue Mansion or something. Yeah, out. Trastodon, whatever. It yeah, is. and... Magus of the Order being like something that's telegraph way more makes it quite a bit worse. Still good. I mean, yeah, it's like a dual. It's like a duplicate effect for the Natural Order. If you like Natural Order a lot in your deck and you want more of it, Magus of the Order is here to serve you. But it's the same sort of conundrum where it's like I love all the Magus cycles that reprints basically functionally in a lot of ways of these old powerful cards that yeah. are really hard to get. They just telegraphed a little bit more. But I think this is kind of perfect in that five to seven power range. I, it does really show, all of them really show, the fact that if you make the thing happen on a slight delay mm-hmm. where it's telegraphed, how much weaker it becomes. Because so many of these extremely powerful Yogmoth's Will, Wheel of Fortune, everything, yeah. become like, eh, not even really playable as soon as you're like, it's on a creature and you have to tap the creature. <laughs> right? Yeah, it makes you sad. Yeah, but it, it just shows like that's a way to sort of take these powerful effects and kind of make them fair. Yep. Yeah. Make them at least... But on the other hand, we could just give Whole Breacher a uh, flash, though. The, yeah. You know, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's I promise a, I it's wasn't going to talk about it It's anymore. a pirate. It has to have flash speed because it's trying to jump on... It's trying to breach some holes, Josh. What are you going to do with that sorcery speed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Next is Natural Reclamation. This is a common, this is sort of like, like I always like to name one common that I think has a lot of power. This is 4 no green for an instant with Cascade, and it says destroy target artifact or enchantment. I just think this is a really, really solid budget slash popper card for having a single target removal for things that matter. And you will generally get a land off of this or something else. So, you know, if you're in that, again... You're, but you can't get a land, you gotta cast it. It's Cascade. Oh, Cascade, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. You can get a lot of other stuff <laughs> yeah. off it. So you're gonna get at least something off it. I think this is just one of those cards that if if you're looking for, you know, if you're building someone a deck for the first time, this is kind of a fun effect. Cascading is something that's an interesting mechanic to introduce people to as well. 
Yeah, I'm not as huge a fan of it as you because I want to be able to be up mana when I cascade, right? So the uh-huh. biggest thing I could get is like four CMC off that. And I'm willing to pay like two mana for that effect at instant speed. So it's unlikely I'm going to come out even on mana. I might be up a card though, which is kind of good. I don't know. Blue has a, a counter spell in this set that's the same thing, right? Five CMC right. counter target spell. Cascade. Cascade. Um, which I maybe like even a little better, although Blue has a lot more of counter spells and I don't like five CMC counter spells normally, but at least then I can counter something that's like seven CMC and get something and be and up it's your mana. Turn as and well. be up mana. Yeah. 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 Eh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This next one. Oh boy. A game night special. I mean, it did cool things on game nights. I gotta say it did. And I actually, the more I think about it, the more I'm like this, it, this will be great in certain play groups and really bad in other ones. Yeah. The spikier your play group is the worse this card gets, but the more willing people are just to have fun and like see what happens, the cooler this card gets. So it's root weaver druid two and a green for a two, one elf druid. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent may search their library for up to three basic land cards. They each put one of those cards onto the battlefield tapped under your control and the rest on the battlefield tap under their control. Then each player who searched their library this way shuffles uh, their library. Okay. So let's break down the math of this. Okay. If you have three opponents, all right, let's just view the three different scenarios. If one person says yes, they're going to get three lands, two of them for themselves and one for you. If two of them say yes, uh, there are going to be four total lands for them, two between both the players, and then so two lands So all three players get two lands. Yep. And then if three players say yes, then they're all going to get two, 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 so six total, and you're going to get three. So, <laughs> there's not really a scenario in there where that sounds good. No, and you're also down the card because you're playing a creature. So, it, this sucks if one person says yes, then you just get one land. Maybe it's an off-color land. Well, you didn't even go through the scenario where if nobody says yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're right, right. Sorry, that's the worst scenario. I was just presuming it didn't happen because that's not, it's not cool. Yeah, because a three-mana 2-1 that does nothing, which your opponents can definitely collude and decide that's what's happening to you. And that's kind of what we've told people as well when it comes to the collective voyages or template discoveries. It's sometimes, don't do it. Don't do it. In this case, these are basics. basics. That makes it a lot more palatable because it's, you know, they can't go get guys' cradle, cabal coffers, yeah. and Urborg. You know, it, it's kept in check. I kind of like the tempt with deck style because it feels very group huggy everyone benefits off it and it kind of accelerates the game i mean that last game that's episode would would have lost a lot of that like whoa moments if we didn't all have an extra two and a half lands or whatever in play it really didn't make everybody able to throw big punches at you know the whole game which i think is cool yeah one other thing we didn't talk about here is that you're not searching your land your deck for the lands Mm -hmm. so depending on what deck it's in they can try and give you lands that aren't of the colors you're in so that's even worse that's like another downside because you could get lands that basically don't produce a color that's useful to you yeah. so they kind of give you wastes or something oh, basically. Wastes. so you know there's a lot of downsides on this card i i don't think it's very good i i wouldn't really run it in our play group but i do think there are play groups where if people are more down to just be like yeah whatever let's just yeah, everybody has a lot of lands we'll cast huge things oh, yeah yeah but i think in our play group most of the time people are like i'm not doing it if you're like the green deck and you're playing with a lot of people that don't have ramp in the same ways that you do it could be a fun way to be like hey you know i wanted everyone to join in on the fun right root weaver druid root weaver druid keep on weaving okay uh, this next last card is just a very notable reprint because this used to be one of the 10 most expensive cards outside of the reserve list. It was? Yeah, because oh it's gosh. from Portal 3 Kingdoms, which is a very And now it's an set. uncommon? Yes. And not just that, it's a card that should pretty much go in any deck that plays a rampant growth. It's three visits, one in the green for a sorcery. Search your library for a forest card. Put that card on the battlefield and shuffle your library. Craig was very excited about this. He thinks it's stronger than Rampant Growth. He's going to put it into Zakama. Notice a forest card, first of all, not a basic. Comes in play untapped. Untapped! So, nature's lore, a lot of similarities. In fact, it's basically the same as nature's lore, nature's lore, Mm -hmm. Rampant Growth, Farseek. Now, this... This can search Sikur up Tribe Elder is a shock lands. This can search up your dual lands. It's yeah. very powerful. What so, did Craig say? Let's let's quote Craig here. Stronger than rampant growth. The fact that I can search up duels and forest cards. Untapped! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Yeah, I mean, I'm glad they reprinted it because it sucks that there's a card that some people just have access to because they just happen to have it or have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I didn't own a single three visits before this set. It was one of me the, neither. Yeah. However, 
I'm a, it's a little annoying because there's so many landfall decks and just giving them yeah. another like awesome tool because they'll basically basically run unlimited amount of these two mana sorcery this is, put a, yeah. land into play. This is straight up a staple. Yeah. So now it's just like, okay, great. So now we got another card that's going in every green deck and I get it. The only way it wasn't, the only reason it wasn't before is because it's expensive. Yeah. You know, so that's a bad reason to not be running it. But I, I guess I'm glad they didn't design a new one of these to make up for it. Like, but let's, right. let's stop with the two mana green put lands into play no more of those just reprint the ones we currently have don't create any new ones it's already too many i agree okay okay we will uh take a quick mid-roll break to hear from our sponsors but when we come back we're definitely going to be talking about more cards and maybe complaining about them <laughs> <laughs> that's our brand now yeah uh, uh, crap. but just for this episode Good day. I probably don't need to tell you that Akoria is a wild and dangerous place filled with incredible monsters of all shapes and sizes. In fact, I'm currently working on a six-part documentary series exploring the amazing triomes, crystals, flora, and fauna of the region. After all, I am Shevel, Bane of Monsters. But do you know what my Bane is? Hair loss. Sure, I can face down a charging, mutated dino cat, no wuckers, but I'm terrified at the prospect of my own thinning hair. Thankfully, now there's Keeps, the simple and easy way to keep your hair. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription, which was a real problem for me because I'm constantly out in the wilderness trying to track down those rare beasties. But now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get your medication delivered right to your home, which means no pharmacy checkout lines or awkward doctor visits. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. If you're ready to take action, go to keeps.com slash command to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash command. Crikey! That sounded like the mating call of a flycatcher giraffe in. I gotta go get that on film. Hey, Josh, um, just wanted to say goodbye. I'll probably be back in about three weeks. Three weeks? We have content to record. I didn't even know you had a trip planned. Oh, well, remember how I said I wanted to binge Doctor Who this weekend? Well, turns out it's only on UK Netflix, and How I Met Your Mother is only on German Netflix, so I just decided to make a whole trip out of it. Jimmy, you know you don't have to go to all that trouble to watch your favorite shows, right? You can just use ExpressVPN. For Netflix? For any streaming service. Just fire up the ExpressVPN app, set your location to any of almost 100 different countries, and watch whatever you want. It works on Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, anything. Ooh, but what about anime? Japan's so far away, I bet the connection's slow. Not with ExpressVPN. Their speed is ridiculously fast. It even works on phones and smart TVs. And if you visit our special link right now, expressvpn.com slash command, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Support the show, watch what you want, and protect yourself at expressvpn.com com slash command. ExpressVPN sounds great. Okay, well, see you in three weeks. Three weeks? No, we just covered this. You don't have to go anywhere now. Yeah, I do. I gotta go home and watch all these shows. Duh. For justice and peace, I will keep watch. For the life of every plane, I will keep watch. For the sake of the multiverse, I will keep watch. Until all have found their... Oh, and I'll also keep a nice clean shave using my Harry's razor, so I'm always looking cool. What does that have to do with keeping watch? If we're gonna patrol the multiverse, we need to look good. And nothing makes me look as good as the smooth, close shave I get from Harry's razors. I could use some grooming. Tell me more. Gladly. Harry's razors aren't expensive over-engineered razors. They're just high-quality blades at a great price. I love quality blades. <laughs> we know you do, Gideon. And Harry's razors stay sharp. They're honed at a factory with over 100 years of experience on a mystical plane called Germany. Oh. They even have their own oath of quality, offering a 100% money back guarantee. Very honorable. What's more, Harry's has a great offer for Command Zone listeners. New US customers can redeem a Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash command for just $3. You'll get a five blade razor featuring their new sharper blades, a weighted ergonomic handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blade when you're on the go. Just go to harrys.com slash command and redeem your trial offer today. I love trials. We know you do, Gideon. Kumbaya's witches. Kumbaya's witches. Kumbaya's witches. Kumbaya's. That's it. That's the first time we've done a out of mineral break song. We were just inspired. 
Yeah. Because Kumbaj, which is, I, I don't really know how you say it. <laughs> we don't really need to talk about this card. It is black, black for a 1 3. It deals one damage to any target and one damage to any target of an opponent's choice. It's a throwback because on game nights, the Nostalgia Edition, I think. Yep, with Graham and Kathleen. Uh, Graham played this card and we all laughed about it. Also, that Seb McKinnon art. Sweet. So sweet. Also, it combos really well with Jandor Saddlebags. <laughs> That card's actually underrated because it does do two damage to a target. Right. Because you can choose any of your opponents. So all you got to do is choose some other opponent's thing. That's down. And tap and deal yeah. two damage. And yeah. someone's down to help target that afterwards. Yeah. All right. We are talking about the black cards from Commander Legends. Jimmy, we're almost there. We're on the home stretch. We got black cards, artifacts, and lands. And then we're done talking about Commander Legends forever. Just kidding. I wish. <laughs> all right. The first black card is Elvish Dreadlord. Three black black for a three three zombie elf has death touch. It says when it dies, non-elf creatures get negative three, negative three until end of turn. Okay. But it has encore for five black black. Okay. So for seven mana, you make three of these, and then you can either sack them or at the beginning of your next end step, you have to sack them because of encore. And that will give everything that's not an elf negative nine, negative nine. Wow, that should kill everything. In an elf tribal deck, this is a one-sided board wipe. Even just this by itself, minus three, minus three and non-elf creatures, we'll get rid of a lot of stuff. Or like finish off some things, maybe if you do it after combat. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, sack point. it or play and sack it or whatever. Yeah, if you swing with a bunch of like two, two elf tokens. They're like, whatever, block this stuff. Yeah, and you're like, play the sack it. Yeah. Um, this is good, good against the gods too. They're really problematic, hard to get rid of, indestructible. Um, so giving them minus uh, is is very powerful. Only if they're creatures, which unfortunately often they're not. Yeah, uh, I think in general, like this is not an amazing card. I think this works really well in elf tribal, but it's nothing to you know get crazy about. Don't get crazy, everybody. Yeah, five mana for the initial cost, and you kind of need a sack outlet to sort of do this at at instant speed. The weird thing is that it has death touch, and people aren't going to try to block this anyway. Because they don't want to die. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. (laughs) It's very unblockable. (laughs) Okay, next up, we have Feast of Succession. Another Seb McKinnon just banger. The art is sweet. Yeah, four black, black, uh, sorcery. All creatures get minus four, minus four until end of turn. You become the monarch. So kind of Elvish Dreadlord vibes here. Um, minus four, minus four is, again, going to kill a lot of stuff. But it's a six mana board wipe when Damnation exists. Eek. Also, yeah. So you're telling me, because Languish is this, right? Yeah. But two black, black. So becoming the Monarch costs two mana? That's Isn't just lot. drawing a card two mana? <laughs> yeah. And then you're not also putting a thing onto the battle, onto, into the game that other people can use as card advantage. Yeah, you're not going to, and that monarch may not stick around, right? Because yeah. you're right, people can take it from you. I mean, it is a cool idea. Like, I wipe the board and then I'm the monarch, but it's hard to take back because nobody has creatures. But it's negative four, negative four. A lot of stuff's going to live through it. Right. So I don't. Do you yeah. think this card could have just been destroy all creatures? You become the monarch for six mana. That I think would have been fine, and then I think it actually would be decent, but not like amazing, right? Yeah. Like, this isn't uncommon, by the way. So yeah. get ready for it in limited. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's not that great. This next one's interesting. Uh, along similar lines, right? Mm-hmm. It's called Necrotic Hex. It's six and a black for a sorcery, so seven mana. Each player sacrifices six creatures. That's mm. including you. And then you create six tapped 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens. So everybody oh. sacks six creatures, including yourself, and then you get six 2-2s. Two, They're tapped. This is seven mana. This is most of the time going to wipe the board. Yeah, six creatures that, I mean, I rarely can think of games unless someone's doing that token thing. Yeah. Um, and you, no matter what, right, if, even if they can't sacrifice six creatures, you will still get six 2-2 two, two black zombies. So at its absolute worst, seven mana get t- six tap 2-2s. Two, Not the worst. I mean, like if it was black and X create, a two, create that many 2-2s, two, right. it'd be pretty good, right? Because... Yeah, it is sorcery speed. You can't like instant speed it out. Um, you thought it'd be interesting to compare this to Decree of Pain, which is eight CMC, uh, six black black to destroy all creatures, and then you draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. Um, and Decree of Pain has a cycling option. A cycling which option, you yeah. Rarely see, but I think it's tough because seven versus six is something. I mm-hmm. think Decree of Pain is just going to be better most of the time, but Necrotic Hex is, you know, uh, uh, it's a decent board wipe. Seven mana is just a lot. And if you're in an aristocrats deck, I could see this working because then, boom, you get all these extra tokens to sacrifice. Plus, you want to sack stuff that's already on the board. Oh, man. May God have mercy on your soul if you <laughs> cast this and you have Grave Pact or something out. Yeah. Or if you cast this and just have two drain effects. You know, Tate of Erebos. You could oh, get, it's going to be brutal. You could get like six, everyone's like, oh, 12 drains. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone's like, oh, I everything. lose 12 creatures. And now you have six more creatures you can sack to kill the next six creatures I play. Yeah. And you're draining my life with Aristocrats. So th- I think this card is actually, it's it's cool. It's, it's not 
busted. It's not underpowered. It's it works even if it doesn't do its top thing to the max. You are sacrificing creatures yourself, so you want to make sure that you're in a deck that wants to sac creatures and has the fodder for it if you're going to abuse that uh, effect. That'll take the leg out of some creature decks that you're facing, though, for sure. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, you have no creatures, and by the time you rebuild your board, I already start with six blockers. Like, yeah, and it gets rid of uh, Indestructible and sort of... Things edict, yeah. Too, yeah. That's a good point. All right, Nightshade Harvester, three in the black for a 2-2 Elf Shaman. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, that player loses one life, and you play a plus one, plus one counter on Nightshade Harvester. This is like a goodbye ramp decks. Not goodbye. Yeah, it's just sorry, like sorry. mildly annoying yeah. to ramp decks. <laughs> you're like the neighbor that like doesn't, isn't helpful. You yeah. Know? You're like, hey, and you're like, oh gosh, the neighbor's mowing their lawn at 8 a.m. again. That's what this feels like. <laughs> I like this. I think there are so many landfall decks right now. It's pretty annoying. Yeah. Let's make some more cards that punish the landfall. This is a good way to punish all that green rampant growth stuff too. Um, it's hard for people to complain about too, right? Yeah. It's not like you're doing something that stops them from doing it, like a whole breacher. They the, still get their lands. They're just getting pinged a lot more. I wish it did like three damage, honestly, because it's a four drop. So that damage right. is not really going to matter too much. Um, three damage. I'll take two for fair. It's a creature. You can destroy it. Uncle Mishra costs two mana. It's harder <laughs> to destroy and does two damage for everything. That's the one that does you damage for every non uh, non basic you control. Deals you damage one. for yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the, it's a, it's a red card. Yeah, yeah, but that's the kind of effect I enjoy. <laughs> uh, oh, it's uh oh dang it! I have it in the Obosh deck too. Price of progress. Ah, yeah, yeah. Deals damage equal to the number of non basic lands, or twice the number of non basic lands each player controls. That could be a lot of damage. That's um, a that's a good card against uh, landfall decks, but it's a one off thing. Yeah, I like these persistent effects. I think they should have more of them. Just incidentally put it on a bunch of cards. Like, hey, and by the way, if anybody plays a land, they take two damage. Well, here's the thing: black has so many aristocrats effects. Maybe we can make this more of an evergreen thing that black has. Maybe other colors can even. I mean, I could see. No, I can't do it, but <laughs> <laughs> I could see it happening to other things. Yeah, especially with Kodama of the East Tree out, I think you're going to see even more landfall oh my decks. Gosh. And if someone plays reshape, I don't know Earth. if it's possible to see more landfall decks. I feel like every pot I'm in, at least one deck is landfall, and oftentimes like two decks are, are yeah. landfall. Yeah. All right. Um, ah, here we go. Speaking of complaining, opposition agent two and a black for a three two human rogue has flash. It says you control your opponents while they're searching their libraries. While an opponent is searching their library, they exile each card they find. You may play those cards for as long as they remain exiled, and you may spend mana as though or mana of any color to cast them. So effectively, Jimmy goes to tutor. Tutor. I cast Opposition Agent. I get to choose the card that he tutors for, and and, and I get to cast it, and he doesn't because it's exiled. And the mana doesn't matter uh, color wise. Uh, this is dumb. It's similar to Hole Breacher and Jeweled Lotus. We did a whole video on it, so we're not going to go into it in yeah. depth here. That's it's episode just, 360, by the way. Yeah. Nine episodes ago. Wow, we have done a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. it's going to suck when this <laughs> happens to you. Yeah, and it's tough because like it's not like there are a lot of tutors that dodge this. There's like Limdol's Vault, uh, Demonic Consultation, Tainted Pack, Plunge of Darkness, but those last three are not cheap cards Yeah, because they kind of do another way of searching through your library. I can understand this a little more than Hole Breacher because tutors are very powerful and they end the game and they're a way for you to create redundancy in your deck and combo off faster. So Opposition Agent, not as egregious of a thing to me. I agree. I think punishing tutors or making disincentivizing tutors is a noble goal from a design perspective because one of the things that makes uh, Commander so great and why it's a singleton format, we only allow, allow one of any given card, is to encourage the val the variants to have them be less optimized, to have the strategies be less finely tuned. Mm -hmm. And punishing tutors is a way to stop, you know, the consistency of winning in the exact same way happening a lot of games. But yeah, it's it's just a big feel bad in the way that this card was designed. I, I wish it was a little bit more like even mind sensor, and I also wish it was in white because if you're going to give what is essentially like a new effect, right? We haven't seen anything that does right. this. Yeah, like so you can make a bunch of claims, but in reality, the color pie doesn't have a place to put this exact effect because it hasn't happened before, mm -hmm. and so you can make some justifications to put it almost anywhere you want to. So why not put it in white? Who needs stuff to do because the stuff they currently do is not that great. Yeah, and just make this cost white, 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 or one, one, white. So it's I, restrictive. I love like one white, white, white. Yeah. Three white and one. So again, bump it up one mana to sort of balance it a little bit better and make it so like you got to be in a lot of white to do it. Yeah, I don't understand the need to push the powerful cards that are clearly powerful to three CMC. 
right? Three has like always been that threshold for like, if it's three and under, then this is really up entering into the upper echelons of where power can be based on what we've seen in other competitive formats. So All right. four mana should be fine. Okay. We did a whole video about that and Jeweled Lotus. So if you want to hear more about it, which why would you? But if yeah. you do, then you can find that video. It's called Are These Design Mistakes? I think is what it's called. Yep. Yep. All right. Next up is the last black card. It's Plague Reaver. We mentioned this earlier in the show. Two in the black for a 6-5. Whoa. At the beginning of your end step, sacrifice each other creature you control. <laughs> and then the second ability is discard two cards, sacrifice Plague Reaver. Choose target opponent. Return Plague Reaver to the battlefield under that player's control at the beginning of their next upkeep. So they have from their upkeep until the beginning of their end step. Otherwise, this Plague Reaver is going to sack each creature they control. However, they can discard two cards anytime to sacrifice it and then give it to someone else. Or if they find a way to just get rid of it, then it just goes away. Can they give it back to you? <laughs> they can. They 100% can give it back to you. So you're going to want to play this in the deck with cards like Witchbane Orb that give you Hexproof. So you can't be targeted by it. Mm. Um, this card is interesting. I think like in a Tiny Bone deck where you're draining people's hands they're not gonna they don't want to discard uh, yeah and or they, they don't have, have the cards, the cards. Uh, yeah oh, brutal the thing is when they draw their card for turn that's one they only need two so they just need a way to get one more card blim comedic genius loves giving things away oh so you just straight up give this to them without doing the thing yeah if you're playing like the chainer decks then you can also reanimate this basically and just keep giving it to people and keep bringing it back um in corvold fake cursed king it's interesting because mm. you want to sacrifice stuff and when you sacrifice the corvo is going to see it and you're going to draw a card to kind of replace the Even though you got to sack corvold in that case yeah uh, unless you pay two to discard two cards and then sacrifice it then you're getting the card back interesting and you can start giving it away from there and Corvold, I don't think you're ever worried about having cards in your hand in that deck. Greven, I would think about this card just because it's three mana, six, five, you're going to yeah. sack it to Greven. Oh, right, so right, good it's point. just a lot of power and toughness for that amount of mana. So yeah. it can backfire though. Uh, mm -hmm. But also if it's just a three drop that you play and it's your only creature, you don't have to sacrifice anything. You just swing away for, you yeah. know. It's yeah. kind of got that rotting registrar type feel where it's like a three mana powerful thing with a slight downside. Yeah. Well, not slight. This one's a little bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all the black cards. We're moving on to artifacts now. Um, all right, I'll start, I guess. Sure. The first one is called Blade Griff Prototype. Five mana for a 3-2 flying griffin. Five generic mana. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you destroy target non-land permanent of that player's choice that one of your opponents controls. Oh, okay. So I swing this and I hit Jimmy with it. I go no blocks because... And I then, have a choice now. Yeah, so it triggers, and now Jimmy gets to destroy a non-land permanent, but it has to be one of my opponents. Yes. So he's basically choosing a non-land permanent of the other two players. Or myself, if I'm crazy. Oh, that's actually a good point. Oh, or if you had something on you that you didn't like. Oh, yeah, like the Hex deck. Yeah. Right? Or the ones that are casting those curses. Yeah, rarely um, comes up, but it could. You're right. I think this is a pretty cool design. I have five mana does seem like a lot, but the fact that it forces you to work together with other people to get rid of problematic stuff is, I think, a really interesting space to design into for Commander. Yeah, politics here, and it, it, it the fact that, like, well, if Jimmy is the one with the problematic thing, even if I worked over him in the past, I'd mm -hmm. just be like, hey, Mel, is it okay if I swing at you, and then you will choose to destroy that really scary thing he's got? Right. And most of the time, your opponents are going to be like, yeah. It's only three damage. Yep. It, it's right. It's a five mana artifact, so it's not that uh, cheap to play. So I go, Mel, will you not block this thing if I attack with you? And then you can destroy anything scary from the other two. You get to choose. I don't even care. And she's like, yeah, okay, good, deal. And then Josh casts Sword of Feast of Famine and equips it onto the Blade Group prototype. <laughs> Mel, you're still going to hold that deal, right? Mel, you said. You said I could swing at you. And you I wouldn't block any, it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't make any promises about that I wasn't going to do anything to it between <laughs> now and then. <laughs> I think there are a lot of fun things to do about, but it's true. Like, do you go back on that deal? It's like, holy moly, whoops. Um, I think this card's really fun if you have like a flame shadow conjuring. Uh, sneak attacking this thing seems kind of fun too. Perforous bronze blood, it's an artifact so you can get it out. Because uh, the five mana does seem a little bit prohibitive. Yeah. Um, especially if you need it to swing. and Because this is the kind of thing too, if you play it, someone's going to like, okay, I, I need to remove that because I know what you're going to do with it. Yeah, because uh, I obviously have the scariest thing and you're going to kill that. So yeah. I want you to do that. Yeah. Uh, a submission from Ashlyn was like, hey, let's play this with Lethal Form Engine or Stranic Resonator. Uh -huh. Always fun ways to double up the ability. And she said this would be a fun card to go in the Thanos deck. And Thanos is blue and red for a 1-3 with haste. And you can tap blue and red to tap it to copy target activated or triggered ability you control from an artifact source. So that's like a Stranic Resonator for artifacts in your command zone. That's cool. Yeah, very cool. I like that idea. 
Yeah, you want to destroy two things? Yeah, hey. That's pretty sweet. Yep, and of course, blue-red being the colorless, uh, the colors for artifact decks. Okay, next up is Commander's Plate. It's a one-mana artifact equipment. In the past, this has been very powerful. Uh, let's see what it says. Equip- it's a mythic. Yeah, it's a mythic. It's also really spiky. Look how many spikes is on that thing. Yeah. Dangerous. Uh, if you're going to, instead of using your sword, try and hit someone with your shoulder, that's the armor for you. <laughs> All right, the Quip Creature gets plus three, plus three, and has protection from each color that's not in your commander's color identity. Uh, Equip commander for three, and then equip regularly for five. So if you're a mono white commander, let's say, you would get protection from red, black, green, and blue. That's cool. It's kind of like Animar, too, has protection against the colors that he isn't. Right. Uh, However, if you are playing this with a Kozilek or a Hope of Giraper, you get protection from all colors. That's pretty cool. like Spectral Ward, almost. Yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. Equip three is a lot, but plus three, plus three, and protection from all that stuff is pretty nice. Yeah, and it's equip three only for commander. If you want to put it onto a not commander, it's equip five. Yeah, you never, you're almost never doing that, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think I'm doing this at all anyway. Yeah, I mean. There are some decks that this might be okay, but protection is not the same as, it, it protects it, you know. It's great for getting a Voltron commander in for damage. Right, and that's why Craig was like, I'm playing this in Scytherix. Of course Craig said that. So, from Craig, I'm building this deck again. Again, by the way, that's a keyword here. <laughs> Mostly because this card exists now. It's going to be good black uh, black good stuff, but you know I got to represent the brand with Skittles at the helm. This card is bonker good. It bonkers good in monocolor decks with an aggro theme, but that's not many decks currently, so I'm curious to see how this card tracks in the months to come. I like that from Craig, which is just like... Right, this is, is very limited in its use. It's a mythic, so it's not going to be as easily accessible. But it's very good in specific things. Yeah. And Craig wants to put in infects, so thanks, Craig. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't have asked people for their recommendations. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's gonna, it's, it reads, I think, better than it's going to sound. Because it's going to, like, even in Skittles, it doesn't give protection from black. Black has removal. Yeah, so it's not always going to protect the thing. It's like, eh, it protects it from a lot of stuff, but not everything. And then, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I'm not super high on it. Craig is, though. Yeah, he wants to infect us out. I thought, Craig, I thought you promised no more infect. What happened? Yeah, what happened? All right, uh, the next one is Horizon Stone. Five generic mana for an artifact. It just says, if you would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes colorless instead. Mm-hmm. So if you have mana floating as you change phases, you would normally just lose it. But this allows you to carry it over. Similar so, to Crufix, Crufix yep. Omnath. There's been a few cards in Magic's uh, past that do a similar thing. But this is on a colorless card that any deck can run. Yeah, notably if you're using a card like Eldrazi Temple or Roshin Meanderer, which is on, which is basically giving you mana, but you can only use it for a specific thing. When you move phases, that mana still can only be used for those things. It doesn't, it doesn't like, like change. forget what it is. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. in Modo, if you play MTGO, you'll see it. It'll be like two colorless mana and two colorless only for artifact spells for certain things. Gigantha would be has, an, has a restriction like that. Yep, yep. Um, I think this would be really good in an Urza deck. You can power it out quickly, and God. then you can save the mana. For and it, it taps for mana in there. Yeah, and it taps for mana, and then you know you need that mana as well. Yep. Um, shout out to Murph for Belby. Seems like a card that would be good there too. Oh yeah, because you get all that mana every turn for damaging your opponents, and sometimes you can't spend it all. And so it is colorless to begin with, so you don't really care that you know it. Yeah, it changes, changes the color. color. Yep. Um, I I played that Yurlock deck, and I realized that if you don't actually have anything in the Yurlock deck to play it with, you're taking mana burn too. Oh, so this would allow you to. Yeah, because mana burn only happens. Well, how's your luck worded? He says, a player losing unspent mana causes that player to lose that much life. And Horizon Stone makes so you don't lose the mana. Yeah, it's a replacement effect. So you don't take the damage. That's pretty cool. Yeah, interesting. Um, Uh, Good with Sphinx of the Second Sun. Oh, multiple upkeeps, right? So you you can can, tap it all, yeah. We talked about that earlier. Good with um, Wilderness Reclamation, Seedborn Muse, those type of things. Yep. Uh, And then from Craig, he wants to put this in Zakama, which is cool because you make a lot of mana in that deck. And he says, good in landfall decks or decks that can make infinite mana easily. Basically, insurance on your mana production, which is cool. And it like that's like we said, can go in any color deck. The next card, a lot of Easter eggs in the art on this one. We'll talk about that in a second. Insane it is amount. Ingenuity Engine. It's an artifact for seven mana. It has Cascade. So when you cast it, you know what Cascade does by now. <laughs> it also has an activated ability. You can pay one and tap it and sacrifice an artifact. Hmm. Return target artifact you control to its owner's hand, not the battlefield, the hand, but still it's only one mana, sack an artifact, get an artifact out of your graveyard, bring it to your hand. Yeah, this can bounce itself notably, so then you can cast it again for another cascade trigger. 
Um, Shroom the Hegemon seems like a really good target for this. Uh, oh, yeah. I said from your graveyard. It's return target artifact you control to its owner's, owner's hand. hand. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. just bounces something in play to your hand. Yeah. Now, the Cascade Trigger is actually something I think is a bit of a trap because you don't necessarily always need that if you just want a card that is good at sacking things and doing the eggs slash bouncing stuff around. Well, infinite mana in this. Yes. You'll Cascade out your whole deck. Right. Anything that's... Uh, six teams here less anyway yeah yeah um so shroom obviously is a card that loves these sort of big mana things if you're playing card clan ironworks or scrap trawler seems like this is a, a deck a card that you should look at um ingenuity engine i thought was funny you can sort of like make each uh, wait brood clad you mean uh, brood clad sorry yeah ingenuity ingenuity engine's the name is the card, card. yeah yeah <laughs> with brood clad you're making a ton of things and then more stuff to sack with it more stuff to bounce Usually have treasures and clues or whatever with brood clad for sure yeah yeah and you're able to ramp out stuff in like ingenuity engine a bit faster uh mind slaver josh could i play this with mind slaver and, mm, and return that that seems brutal or sacrifice I don't yeah yeah <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I think, like, for the most part, you're actually looking mostly for ways to cheat this out. So, Sahili the Gifted mm. is a great way to do it. Doretti Scrap Savant. Um, All those cards that make your artifacts cost less or give your artifacts improvise and things like that. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, what is it, Chief Engineer or whatever. Yep, Chief Engineer, Ethereum Sculptor. Gift Convoke or something, yeah. And then I think, like, the cards that are best with this are Spine of Ishsaw, which cares about leaving the battlefield and entering it, right? Uh, yeah, you destroy yes. a thing. Enters and leaves. And when it leaves, it, you bring it back to your hand. Duplicant, you know, you want to have it reuse that effect. It could wellspring on yeah. both sides of it. So it seems like it has a lot of just uh, cool little synergies. That's all really cool. But what we're going to see the usage of this card is I create infinite mana, I cascade out my whole deck. Yeah. That's and like 90% a, of how that's going to be used. It makes sense. It's an uncommon again. So that's why, you know, I think it's it's not like super busted. It's seven mana and really eight mana to do its thing. So yeah. But the cool thing is there's a bunch of Easter eggs in the art. So, you know, see if you can recognize any of them uh, as we show the art here on screen. They're, well, Vidalcan Ori. Yeah. Clearly Vidalcan Ori. There's a soul ring in there. Uh, Rings of Bright Hearth. Oh, yeah. Sensei's Divining Top, I believe, lives in there somewhere. Hmm. There's a Door to Nothingness, a Sword of Body and Mind, I believe, is the sword. Behemoth Sledge, Dark Steel Relic, Commander Sphere. Lots of cool things. All right. All right, now on the opposite end of the CMC spectrum. It's Jeweled Lotus. Zero mana for an artifact. You tap it and sacrifice it and add three mana of any one color. Spend this mana only to cast your commander. We went into great detail about uh, um, this card, and it's on the list with Hull Breacher and Opposition Agent as a card I don't think either of us really likes. As far as we don't like the design of it, it's undoubtedly powerful. High variance. Sometimes it's not going to do a lot if you draw it late, but when you draw it early in the right deck, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, you um, power out a really powerful commander quickly, and especially if that kind of commander takes over the game. Could just be a non-game really fast. Yeah, or you generate so much value, it's like a Corvold or something, and you're just so off to the races yeah, that it's hard too lane. to keep up. Um, yep, so anyway, we did an entire video about it. It's called Are These Design Mistakes? It's episode number 360, if you want to hear us talk about it, slash complain about it more. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't want that? All right, Phyrexium Trinaform is our final artifact card. It's a 9-mana, nine 9-9 nine, nine artifact creature, Golem. And one Phyrexian Trinaform dies, create three 3-3 three, three colorless Golem artifact creature tokens. And of course, this card has Encore for 12 mana. So for 12 mana, you get to make potentially three other 9-9s nine that when they die, make three 3-3s. Three, three so you get nine 3-3s? Three, yes, yeah, so you get a ton of stuff here. Um, this is a very expensive card. Nine mana and then Encore for 12. I don't expect to see this very often unless you're cheating it out or finding ramping so fast for finding ways to reduce that mana cost by a ton yeah cheating out artifacts or you're in like belby or something that's creating a ton of colorless mana very fast yeah but if you're like in a taste of karlov deck or if you're a brew the clad deck and you want to copy oh. make so many tokens when they all leave the battlefield that'd be kind of cool or at least you can also use the brew clad on the tokens that it makes right because right? brew clad's often looking to be like okay i just want one token that's like larger than a 2-1. Yeah, and they're all 3-3s three now. Yeah, at least that's better, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Anamara should be able to play this pretty quickly. And then I think you want to do, like, again, the Sahili, the Gifted, fell into the third yeah. path to, to cheat, cheat it in. out. Anamara, oh yeah, totally. Because it's just zero. And then, you know, you want to play your token doublers. And then someone online was like, Stalking Vengeance does 72 damage with this. Stalking Vengeance is oh. 5 red red. Whenever another creature you control dies, it deals damage equal to its power to target player or planeswalker. So if you have sack outlets, you just... Yeah, you'll be able to... Down the yeah, but you have to, again get it out there play it pay 12 mana for it but that's a lot of damage if you have altar right um astronaut's altar then you could pl if you can get this out then you sack it you get eight mana back basically okay so then you only need four more so yeah. 
Big splashy play. Yeah, right. We're not going to skip that much. From Craig, he wants to put this in Rakdos, Lord of Riots, because this is a card that, you know, reduces the cost of cards for each life your opponents have lost this turn. And sometimes you can power out some really big things like Eldrazi. Yeah, you want colorless stuff because it doesn't reduce the colored cost, right? So, yep. All right. Let's move on to the lands now. Oh, we're almost there. We're so close. We yeah, can make it. Little stretch. Okay. Fortunately, five of the lands we don't really talk about. So it's just two more real cards here. All right. First up, it is... Guildless Commons. Guildless Commons. It's a land. It enters the battlefield <laughs> tapped. I was going to say, that's it. It enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. So it's and like every bounce land. It And it taps for diamond, diamond, or two colorless mana. So it's uh-huh. a colorless bounce land. Okay. I think bounce lands are a little underrated. I you tend to want to play like one to two in most decks because when you draw them early and you can find a good spot to play them where they don't cost you that that one mana because they yeah. play tapped they are card advantage because they kind of draw you a land back to your hand they can then play the next turn yeah exactly so you can sort of keep le- uh land light hands to just help you hit an additional land drop um mm-hmm. if you're playing in this a kodama of the eastern yeah. tago deck these lands allow you to go infinite by just sort of repeating the bounce over and over again and putting tons of rocks into play yeah, we um, talked about that on the episode. Yeah, play a land, make a rock. The rock allows you to play a land, which makes a rock, and then you keep going down the line. Yeah. And with bounce lands, yeah, they kind of do that on their own. If you're playing Amulet of Vigor, it untaps those lands when they come into play. Um, but yeah, bounce lands, I think, are just very good in the fact that we have one, a card like this. This is a card I think is totally fine. Great for the format. You know, Now every color, including white, can have access to a bounce land. Yeah, and I think that going into two-color decks, you could only have one bounce land before, and now you could have two, and I think... Oh, right having two color decks be able to have two i often want two i don't yeah, usually, you don't want to go more than that right yeah i usually don't want more than that and three color decks could already have two so i don't think this is really that useful in those unless you have some reason for colorless mana specifically mm-hmm. probably good for kozilek decks and stuff though because they're just always looking for lands to tap for colorless good point speaking of lands to tap for colorless it's war room uh you tap it for a colorless mana or you can pay three and tap the land pay life equal to the number of colors in your commander's color identity draw a card so three mana but Kind of four because you have to tap this land as well. It is definitely four mana. Yeah. And then you pay life. So if you're in a monocolor, it's four mana and a life to draw card. Mm -hmm. If you're in dual colored, four mana, two life on up the chain. They're trying to help monocolored decks, specifically white and red, I think. By making this hurt less. Yeah. I wish they would have templated it so it costs less mana if you're monocolored. Oh, Then it would help like mono blue. Oh. Yeah, so it's tough. If you are mono right or mono red, (laughs) then you get this. I don't know how you template it for that, but maybe they could have said pay, uh, because then it wouldn't work for both. Like you could say pay a hybrid white red plus uh, one man, the number of mana equal to your commander's color and then draw a card. Yeah, I, I, I can't see myself ever wanting to pay for, I know a lot of people are high on this card. I've seen a lot of chatter on Twitter and stuff about people that like it. I personally, four mana for a card. I just can't imagine wanting to do that. Eight mana for two cards. Yeah. 12. It is on a land, so the the, the cost of it is low. So maybe, Just having it in your deck and if you're stuck, right? It's something you can do at the very least. Yeah. But I feel like I'm losing that game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if I ever get to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm happy. I'm more than once I'm paying four mana to draw a card. I'm probably losing that game. We've seen you dig out of some crazy holes though. So this is one. It's of not those. usually with War Room though, right? Like <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. It's from drawing cards that are more impactful than that. Um, Bonders Enclave is a card that's very similar. You can only do it however if you have a creature of power four or greater. And then this is just clearly better than Arch of Orozco, which costs five to tap the card and draw. And you have to have the City's Blessing. Um, I think if you're playing a Zerd of the Dawn Waker deck, then these activate abilities mm-hmm. feel a lot better yep. in general. Um, and that's about it from ashlyn she said the synergies is great with her kaza kins her kaza like the great distortion deck um because kaza like's always looking for more cards in hand to discard for counters and you pay zero life for it as well it's colorless yeah and so like you're discarding cards of kaza like but you also want to draw cards and she has tons of mana rocks in that deck obviously great more things that make her kaza like deck better no <laughs> uh and then from craig he's been trying this out in a few decks and he he's going to try in a few decks and against the comma is a is a one that he wants sure. for this so because you often just have a lot of extra mana plus you can untap it yeah yeah i can see if your deck can just already is set up to be able to untap this then it gets a little bit better because at least then mm-hmm. you know on those turns where you're really doing nothing you might be able to like draw two cards with it and get dig yourself out of a hole right. maybe josh right. that's it what that's all the cards we like really need to do in depth analysis about. Oh, we yeah, we have one more cycle that we got to at least mention, but we don't there's not much to say about it. So I'm but I'm glad they did it, right? Yeah. 
And if they could reprint these all the time, I'd be very happy. So in Battle Bond, we got these lands that we call the Battle Bond lands. I'm not really sure what the right nomenclature is. But anyway, they say they enter the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. But in Battle Bond, we only got five of the color combinations. Mm -hmm. So there are 10 two-color combinations. And in this uh, set, we got the other five. So Undergrowth Stadium, Training Center, Vault of Champions, Spectator Seating, and Rejuvenating Springs. Sorry to the editors because they had to show all those. <laughs> white, this is black, the... red, blue, blue, green, uh, black, green, white, red, green, blue. Yeah, so these are the enemy pairs. And so now we have the full cycle. And these are amazing, right? They don't have land types on them, so you can't fetch for them. That's the only downside. But in Commander, they are effectively... And as the battlefield, dual lands. Yep. They're better than shock lands on, um, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not when you're fetching, but these are, it's awesome. I'm glad that we have them. Here's the thing we learned from Battlebond. Grab these right now. They will go up in price because so many commander decks want to play these lands. Yeah, they're very universal. Um, you're going to want them in your four color decks, three color decks, two color decks. They're just easy ads and they don't, but they will not cost you very much right now. So go to cardcamecom slash command zone. There you go. All right, we did it. Now we officially did it. We talked about, I feel like, every single card in the set. Yeah, my head hurts. Yeah. My brain hurts. My uh, we're going to do one last thing here before we close this up, because um, we like to do this at the end. We're going to sort of have two categories, mm -hmm. what we think the most powerful new card is, and then what our favorite new card is in the set. Let's start with most powerful. It's funny how often the most powerful card in the set is not our favorite card. Yeah, generally not. Um, so obviously we've talked about all of them this episode. It's going to be between the big four of Jeweled Lotus, Opposition Agent, Hole Breacher, and Jessica's Will. For me personally, I'm thinking Opposition Agent because Jeweled Lotus, as amazing as it is, like we've said, it's not going to be great later on in the game. And I've seen tutors win the game on you know early turns as well as late turns. And not to mention Opposition Agent just houses so many different cards. Yeah, it's going to be brutal when it hits Fetch you. Fetch lands. Yeah. I've had it ha hit me a couple of times now, and it sucks. It's the worst thing ever. Because you lose the card, then they choose a card from your deck, and it's their card now. Yeah. It just feels awful. And then it sits there taunting you, mm -hmm. being like, hey, you still can't fetch land or anything yeah. until you kill this. Um, I'm going to say Jessica's Will. I think powerful is hard to define. If you talked about top end powerful, so how powerful is a card at its most powerful, right. you know, that's different than how powerful do you think the card is on average. Or even at its worst, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. You, if I take the top end and the low end uh -huh. and I kind of average out the scenarios, that's why I think just Jessica's will, because I see myself just putting it in like almost every deck that has red in it. Yeah. And it's at its most powerful, it's probably not as powerful as any of the other cards when they're at their most powerful. But I think in just... In general, generically, it's going to do you good. Yeah, because Opposition Agent, your your opponents have to play a tutor. Now, that's going to happen in a lot of games. It's not like that's hard to make happen, but still. Hole Breacher, it's really good if you have a Windfall or a Wheel or somebody else is going to do those things. Jeweled Lotus, super powerful. Turns one through three, gets a lot less powerful after that. Jessica's Will is just the type of card that, like... It's just always going to be good. Uh, obviously, you have to have your commander out for it to be awesome, but almost every deck wants to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say Jessica's will. Nice. A mono red card for most powerful. Let's go, Josh Lee Kwai. <laughs> I need about 10 of those now. <laughs> I play a lot of red these days, if nobody noticed. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I feel like all I've built is Rakdos and Boros decks for like the last, I don't know. Yeah, and I've just been building a lot of Gruul decks too, I feel. <laughs> okay. It's, the, it's Gruul Tide season, dude. <laughs> It is. We're starting by red and green. All right. Favorite new card. Okay. Do you want to talk about the nominees here? Yeah. I wrote these down. Do you have a nominee that's... That this mostly matches what I was seeing here. I I, I I mean, outside... I mean, outside of the commanders, right? Right, right. So... Yeah. Sorry. We should have said these are not commanders. Most powerful new card that's not a commander. Favorite new card that's not a commander. I put on the list Keeper of the Accord. Yep. Which is the white card that... You can put extra lands in play as long as somebody has more lands than you. And token creatures as well. Jessica's Will, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Hellkite Courser, which sneak attacks in your commander. Yep, and you and, get a big dragon after. And then the Battle Bond lands, which I think are huge and going to be great for, you know, this is another thing where it's yeah. like, yeah, most of my decks are going to put one of these or more Battle Bond lands into it. Um, and every deck that's in any of the colors of these Battle Bond lands is running it, right? Like, yep. you're not, there's not like blue red decks where you're like, boy, I don't need a training center in that thing. I think my favorite new card from the Timmy standpoint has got to be Hellkite Courser because I love dragons and I love cheating in my commander. And, and you love sneak it. attack. Yeah, and I love sneak attack. I love Marchesa. I love all those types of things because uh, you can Hellkite Courser Marchesa and then you can just sack her and bring her back. Okay. Um, but I think Keeper of the Accord has to be me. Just I want to scream out to the skies, more of this. Let's yeah. push this direction. Four mana and up for these types of spells seems like it's fair. Let's not make it seven or eight. But four mana and five mana seems like a really sweet spot to give white some tools 
Bulls to finally start catching up. Yeah, I'm really excited about Keeper of the Court. I, I wish we would have got another good white card in this set that's that we could put on the most powerful list. You know, just change one of those opposition agent, Holbreach or Jessica's will. Well, yeah. no, I don't want to take it from Red, so the other two. Okay, but thanks. Keeper of the Court... <laughs> I, again, another card that's going in a lot of my white decks. I've seen it in action a few times now. We have. We both have. And mm-hmm. it does work. Like, it will single-handedly keep the white deck from running into that problem it used to run into, which is that it just, later in the game, has six mana when everybody else has nine to ten. Um, again, you have to, it's one card. you got to draw it. you got to get it out. So it's not like it single-handedly makes white awesome. But when you draw it in a game and get it out there... It does do what it's supposed to do, which I really like. It's hard for people to get rid of it, too, especially if white is catching up. If yeah, it doesn't like, feel like a necessary yeah. removal target. Like, oh, God, we better kill that. And But I think the way that it affects the game later is hard to even... You don't attribute the fact that, man, the the Boros deck or the white deck is actually in this game and doing well. Because of those like, three extra back. lands. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I really like that card. All right, to the listeners... What do you think of the cards we talked about in this episode? What color do you think got the best cards from the entire set? Are there any uh, favorite, wow, I can't believe they brought X uh, old character back from yeah. the whole set. You know, there was a lot of love for uh, Jared, Cartharian, yeah, Hans Erickson, Baron Sangir. Baron a lot Sangir, of people were excited yeah. about a lot of the characters. So, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Uh, and of course, we talked about so many cards today. We just talked about how you got to pick up those Battle Bond lands. There's no better place to do it than cardkingcom slash command zone. Not only do you get to get the cards you want expedited quickly to you in good condition, you also get to support this podcast and help us hopefully never have to do nine set reviews in a row again. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. My brain hurts. But we talked about a lot of cards. And again, like s- just straight up, I always just use cardkingcom uh, slash command zone it's the easiest thing to do i don't need to worry about coming in different sized envelopes shipped from across the country from a kid in his basement in bad condition yeah i've seen stuff come with top loaders that have tape across oh, the top of tape the actual card yeah. i'm like card kingdom's never gonna do bro, that bro yeah. don't please i'm trying to get some cards over here so card kingdom.com slash command zone they're gonna take care of you and your cards and their customer service is great too also you know they'll draw these personalized tokens for people mm-hmm. someone got a bunch of rocks because they were inspired by your deck awesome. and they sent me a talking. picture and i was like that's so cool <laughs> that's awesome yeah if you're hanging on to that holiday money that you got as a gift this year and you know you're gonna buy magic cards with it anyway cardkingdom.com slash command zone you can get the stuff fast can be in good condition can't recommend them highly enough and when you get that stuff you want to protect your game pieces right you we must spend, we spend a lot of money on our cards um on our decks we spend a lot of time which is often more important like how off how mm-hmm. how much time do you spend just thinking about every card in your deck spending time online and you don't want that to go to waste you don't want those cards to get hurt or ruined so ultra pro really is the best company out there to provide you with the stuff that's going to protect your game pieces they got the hyper gloss or sorry the pro gloss e- yes. eclipse sleeves they have uh, you know the best play mats in the biz they have awesome deck boxes satin tower deck boxes great for traveling keeps your cards safe yep. snug so if you really want to keep all of your cards safe, they have awesome binders and things like that. Mm-hmm. Ultra Pro products are the best way to do it. That's kind of like my favorite mini game about Magic, which is I trade in cards and you want them to stay in great condition. And the way to do that is by putting them in the sleeves. I know that foiling has had some issues. So if you put it into a sleeve and keep it compacted for a while, it will eventually start to unbend it as it dries out as well. So like that's- Sometimes. A, sometimes. <laughs> but I've noticed, right? Like, again, the only way to do it is putting it in protective stuff. And yeah. you ha- at least take some steps there. And so Ultra Pro is that fun fun mini game of like i'm gonna get the best value for these cards in the long run as well as in the decks that i'm playing right now plus you know oftentimes my favorite decks there's not a lot i can do to them with magic cards anymore right because i have all the right cards in there right and i have the versions i like and whatever but one of the things i can do is like theme my playmat to it theme my deck right. box to it theme my sleeves to it theme my relic tokens to it and that's a way to continue to like keep make building onto your deck and making it cooler and cooler mm-hmm. you know once you have all the cards you want so ultra pro for sure um, all right. No end step today. No end we step. We refuse. Back in, uh, I think the next episode will be next year in 2021. Oh. So then we'll start the end step back up. So yeah. Jimmy, start thinking of some cool stuff to talk about. Yeah, I'll definitely binge some stuff. I'm watching some stuff now that I could talk about in the end step, but I'm going to save it. Save it. I've talked enough today, this That's month, true. this year. Yeah. Oof. Ooh, my voice needs a rest. Everybody out there, just want to wish you a happy new year. Yes, and the happiest of holidays. Hope you're staying warm and safe and, you know, obviously safe is the big word here for this year. And I hope we all, or I know we all are hoping that 2021 will be uh, will be a, a, a wide turn, a, a different direction than yeah. this past year. It's been rough for a lot of people and, and I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. So, yep. yeah, wishing everybody out there a very happy new year. And a very good starting seven. No mulligans. 
because I think I molded to like three last year, so it felt like. <laughs> yeah, this year did feel like a mold to three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, <laughs> yeah. Next year will be the perfect opening of hand, I hope. Yes, absolutely. Two lands, one of them's an ancient tomb, and a sensei's divining top. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking for it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. All right. Oh, wait. Clean up step. Thank you, Torchy. Oh, yeah. They've done an amazing job this year. Come and on. you know what? If you see them on Twitter or whatever, send them some love as well. They've been working really hard uh, from home as well, like making do with the situation. And we honestly can't thank them enough. Yeah, geez. Last episode of the year, I almost forgot to mention them. <laughs> uh, so our editing graphics and logistics team is Craig Blanchett, Manson Lung, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Jake Boss, Josh Murphy, Alfred Estaca, Patrick Nan, Sam Waldo, Arthur Meadowcroft, and Jordan Pridgen. Our team has grown a little bit this year. That's a big thanks to everybody out there who supported our Patreons, mm -hmm. our Kickstarters, all the sponsors that we have. You made it happen. Yeah, you really are helping us to grow. And I th hopefully you're seeing the fruits of that with the amount of content we put out and the quality of things like Game Nights and Extra Turn. So thanks to our team. Thanks to everybody out there. And big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer as well, who's always making the 11 card animations that are starting off our show, that cool soul ring. Oh yeah, he made this too for last year's Christmas episode. Yeah, very nice. So anyway... Thank you all so much for watching. I've had a great year thanks to you. And I hope you had one too. Good of us. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>